As a measly pastor, I just like doing sermons sometimes and talking about what God's actually speaking to me about. And because I'm on vacation just like Tim's on vacation today, I decided that as a vacation, I'm just going to look at a passage of scripture where God's speaking to me about myself and share that with you. So we're not doing any of the other really good stuff everybody thinks I ought to do because I don't feel like it. So... <laughs> So let's look in James, James chapter 1, James being a super, super fun book to read, and maybe will be for you or not. We'll see. James chapter 1, verse 19, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not literally merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word, but does not do what it says, is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror, and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Religion that our, our God, that God our Father accepts is pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. This is a passage that's all about listening, how to listen, what we should be doing listening, and so talking about the lost art of listening, because one of the great hazards of the Christian faith that nobody warns anybody about when you actually decide to become a follower of Jesus and you give your life to him and you start getting involved in that whole discipleship process that is called the Christian life, one of the hazards we never tell people is that you're gonna have to spend time listening to sermons. Because that's kind of built in the whole system. And it's a danger. So here's a reality for you, just a little fact check. If we were to live into our 70s, and let's face it, 90 is the new 70, I'm told, and so you're going to get more than this anyway. But if it was just to your 70s and you went to church once a week, and the person only preached half an hour, which we know never really happens, and won't today either, that would mean you're spending three months of your life, 24 hours a day, doing nothing but listening to sermons. That's it, just going on forever. That's right, Mr. Robinson, and most of them are aimed at you. So, <laughs> true. Now that's a conservative estimate because many of us that are in that discipleship journey also go to Bible studies or we uh, perhaps go on retreats sometimes or to Christian camps and things or we listen to podcasts or whatever it may be. So it's really quite a bit bigger than that often. So that means, well, okay, let's look at it a different way. If you became a Christian later in life, so you didn't really have 70 years of that sermon listening that you have to endure, that would still mean you're spending more than one full 24-hour day a year listening to them, just the whole day. Start to finish, no sleep, just doing all that stuff. Or if you looked at it a different way about sermons, if a church averages about 200 people, let's say, per week, that means it's over 400 person hours per month on sermons or 216 people days per year. You with me on that? That means we have to take this fairly seriously because that's a lot of time you're never getting back. There's a lot of time that's wasted if you're here and you're not paying any attention. That's a lot of time that's important to a church. So we're rightfully concerned about teaching people to speak appropriately, to speak biblically, to be grounded in the word of God, all those kinds of things. But maybe we ought to be just as concerned about teaching people how to listen. Not just how the person ought to speak, but how we ought to listen. We put a ton of investment in the church world into training people. So within Fellowship Pacific, here's the only little 
you know, promo you get, is that we go from now from a leadership kind of pipeline of trying to identify people in youth groups, and then from that into gap year programs, into an undergrad program, into a graduate program called Immerse. We continue in ongoing kind of education in preaching. We just did one on a thing. We have a private network called the Commons. So we just did a preaching course on the Commons where we brought in somebody else to kind of teach it. We're doing this all the time. We do micro-credentialing now, which is little things that add up to other things, all in the process of ongoing, continuing development education because this matters a ton because of so much time that's in it. However, if we're gonna put that much time into training people how to talk, perhaps we ought to step back now and then and train people how to listen. And consider that just as seriously. How do we become quality listeners? Because the Bible is shockingly relevant to our world in all kinds of direct ways. So whether we're talking societally about things like SOGI agendas or attestation policies of the federal government relative to getting summer interns in your church or issues of social justice or sex trafficking, trafficking or parenting or ethics in work and government, there's really very, very little in your life that the Bible doesn't speak to, that isn't relevant to you. And if it's critical that our society begin to listen to God, it's even more critical that the people who are his followers do the same thing. Listen to God. And a problem for Christians through the ages, and I would argue still today, is that sometimes we're just like everybody else, which is we're better at telling others what they need to do than we are at listening ourselves. We're better saying other people you need to be a better listener than becoming better listeners, which is the thing that God's been talking to me about a bit, and so that's why we're talking about it today. So let's just talk about three really simple steps in becoming a better listener about what God is saying. And I think it's pretty clean, it's pretty simple, because James is kind of that way. So first off, he starts in the beginning of this, and he tells us if you're gonna be a good listener, you've gotta make proper preparations. You've got to prepare properly. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Quick to listen, slow to speak. Quick to listen, slow to speak. Not my best thing. Maybe not your best thing. There's this famous story about Socrates, philosopher Socrates, who was asked to teach a young man how to become an orator, to become a great speaker. And after making the request, this young man kept talking to Socrates about what he wanted to do and how he wanted to do it and what he was hoping for for his future and how he felt he was going to be a good speaker. He went on and on and on. So ultimately, Socrates covered his mouth, the young man's mouth with his hand, and said to him, I have to teach you two sciences. Because I'm, and I'm going to charge you twice for it. First, I have to teach you how to hold your tongue, and then I'll teach you how to speak. Pretty common problem. Most of us have the same problem. We're so sure we have the answers and things, we don't stop to listen about what's being said. So let me be clear when I'm talking about this, about listening and speaking and sermons. We're talking about the Bible. The Bible and in Bible studies, and in Bible-based kinds of things, it's God his, who is doing the talking. And that's why we ought to be doing the listening. If it's true to the Word of God, it's God's words. And those ought to matter to us. And some of us have the problem in church of trying to talk louder than God. And we do that all kinds of different ways, of course, when God's speaking. Sometimes we think of it as daydreaming which is really just going off in a whole different conversation when God is speaking. I don't know if you've ever done this in a relationship, say a marriage. I'm sure Tim has never done this, where your spouse is talking, and she, you, you know, this occasionally happens. We walk our dog every night at 9 p.m. That's a thing, and my wife will sometimes talk about her day, and she'll then stop, are you listening to me? And I, I'm really actually pretty good. I have like 10% of listening, enough so I can say, oh yeah, you were talking about this. I don't know what she said, but I know what she was talking about enough to get through it. <laughs> Sometimes that's exactly what we're doing in church, but it's God who's speaking. 
and we're listening enough to say we know what God said, but we're not listening enough to, what, to know what God is saying to us. We're not really listening to it. Sometimes we talk about it as just being a short attention span or critical thinking, or we're just evaluating what God being said. But the fact of the matter is we're talking internally when we should be listening to God and what he's actually saying. So Paul starts off and says, be quick to listen, slow to speak. He goes on in it, he talks about the fact that we have to clean up our spiritual lives to prepare so we can focus on God's words, get our life straight so God can speak into our life. Specifically, he talks about moral filth. He goes on, he says in verse 21, therefore get rid of the moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you. Get rid of the moral filth. That's a word that refers to kind of dirty clothes. It's like the shabby clothes that soil our spiritual lives. Spiritually, and, and Paul said, or James says, get rid of that. You got to get rid of that stuff that's hanging on to your life, that's making you dirty, that's spiritually soiling. It's getting the way of you hearing what God is saying. And he goes on to talk about not letting evil go unchecked. It's like weeding our spiritual gardens, continually getting those weeds out of there. Because in our lives, we know this, as we follow along in just societal life, we get weeds in our garden. And just like if you're a gardener, who's a gardener? There's not enough gardeners here. That's, this is a city group. So anyway, <laughs> that's not gardening. So <laughs> that's like tractors and things. So we don't... <laughs> We don't want to get into that. Anyway, if you've got a garden, you know if you weed it once, it doesn't mean your weeds are gone. Right? That's a, that's a beginner gardener mistake. The fact is you're going to have to go back and back and back. Because if you've sowed weeds or seeds and they're blowing from outside or inside your own life or your family or whatever that is into the garden of your spiritual life, you know you're not getting rid of them in one crack. So James says, go back. Weed the spiritual garden. You can't be encumbered by those kinds of things. Now, how do you do that? That's a whole different set of sermons. It's really called discipleship, and how do we walk our life with God every day of our life in multiple different ways. But let me just mention the most obvious first one, which is if we want to have those things, get rid of moral filth, watch out for the evil that's spreading those weeds in our life, spiritual life, we need to start by praying before we listen. Going to God and saying to God, hey, we want to hear from you, God. Could you reveal into my life the sin that's interfering with me hearing? You need to start asking. We need to start asking for spiritual wisdom, for spiritual discernment in our devotional life, in our time with God, whatever that may be. What are we going to do to start God to do it? Even when we're praying in church sometimes, we'll, you know, we'll pray things like, uh, God, we hope, we hope that's got its own problem. We hope that your Holy Spirit will be here. Or we invite your Holy Spirit to be here. Now, we mean that in the sense of uh, we want to be aware of the presence of God. But we also know that God's already promised that where two or three are gathered, his Holy Spirit already is there, right? We know that's true. So the, really, the better prayer would be, God, help us to be as present with you as you already are with us. What we need is his help to hear from him. He's already here. That's already a promise that we know. But we start praying for all those kinds of things, and it's pretty much like any other weeding, like any other work washing the clothes. It's not that easy. You know, so I've got a lot of little planters. I don't have like a huge yard or anything, but I've got a lot of flower, you know, planter things with flowers in them and different kinds of vegetables and blueberries and all that stuff scattered in kind of an urban garden kind of way within it, which is really super fun. I like all those things. But what I never liked a ton was the hour and a half it took me a day to water them all. You know, walking around with the hose, it's just like, okay, if I don't do this, they all die. And the thing I really didn't like is, because my kids are faulty in so many different ways, is that when I'd go away on a summer vacation, and if, you know, you're talking to them even when they were living there, could you water the garden when I'm gone? You know what happens, right? They don't water the garden. That's because they haven't weeded the spiritual weeds in their life. But nevertheless, and so I'll come back after fertilizing, planting flowers, watering them an hour and a half a day. I'll be gone for like a week, and the weather's like it is right now, and my plants are all dead. It's a horrifying thing. Proof of sin. But here, so... I did what any sane person would do, is I spent about two weeks of a vacation a few years back digging trenches and putting irrigation all through my yard 
and into a little tiny baby sprinkler into every single planter for everything and flower. How many of you have irrigation like that? Yeah, it's a gift of God. It's a proof of God's love. So, and I have it, it's on the internet, so I can water it from anywhere in the world. And it has water sensors, so you can do a schedule for it. It has water sensors. If it's too dry, it waters a bit more. If it's raining, it waters a bit less. It's the greatest thing ever since my dog. So, you know, it's... Awesome, but it took me two weeks of digging to do it because if you want to water your garden, if you want it to thrive, you're going to work at it, right? If you want to hear from God, you're going to work at it. But here's a reality in today's world, and it's a bit archaic of me perhaps to think of it even this way. I wonder sometimes, uh, and don't hear me, this is not a guilt thing because I recognize the need for the community part of it, but I do wonder sometimes where we lost that thing where people would even come to say a church service ahead of time and sit there just for five minutes before and pray that God would speak to them. The simplest of steps that we could do because we want to hear from God. Now, it's a great thing, and you guys have done a great job and did a great job today actually praying for that in your service, which is pretty awesome. But even so, we as individuals want to take some responsibility for being ready to hear from God, to prepare properly to do it. I was talking to somebody, I don't remember who, about playing hockey, which I used to do a lot of, and played in a league which gradually morphed into playing more and more games Saturday night that got later and later Saturday night. Some of you have been in that little journey of it until ultimately I had to realize it was a moment of fear playing a hockey game that I was going to get a puck in the mouth on a Saturday night at 11.30 and have real trouble doing my job on Sunday morning. Not to mention, even without the puck in the mouth, I'm not at my best when I'm doing that. And somewhere as we mature in our walk with God, if we want to be people who listen to God and hear from God well, we're going to start saying, what are the changes I have to make in my life to hear from him appropriately? To respect the fact that it's God speaking and take it seriously. So first thing we gotta do, proper preparation. Second thing, we have to give God's word a submissive hearing, a submissive hearing. So it's in this last verse at the end of verse 21, where he says, therefore get rid of the moral filth, the evil that's so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Humbly accept the word planted in you. This word humbly is the same word that gets used for a family who's gathering to listen to a will the reading of a will. So, the word accepting, rather, is the word for gathering to hear about a will. So it means that we're going to listen carefully. We're going to anticipate value. It's like when people gather together to hear a will, and maybe, depending on your family and all the dynamics we won't get into, uh, maybe they're thinking there's a bequest. Maybe it means that there's money being given to kids from parents. Maybe it means that we're hoping there's like some final words of perspective from people that we cared about that's going to say something to us that's going to matter. That's how you come to accept it. There's a sense of acceptance that God's saying something. And then we receive those words with a submissive spirit. A submissive spirit. So think about Canadians in general when you hear those words. A submissive spirit. It's why James uses the word humbly. We put ourselves in a submissive posture, physically, emotionally, spiritually, mentally. We choose to sit at the foot of God and learn. Because God has something to say. And we're choosing to say yes to whatever it is that God's choosing to say to us. And in the context of a sermon, that's not super easy. Canadians are not good at submission. We are really good at autonomy. Western Canadians particularly are really good at independence. We're really good at standing up for ourselves. We're really good at exercising and demanding our rights. We don't love submission. We typically hate it. And it's why often pastors will get kind of scared in the sermons and they won't maybe be as strong as they ought to be, even when the Bible says, do this, because we, if we say, do this, we get a lot of emails saying, we are not going to do that. <laughs> I remember when I was a youth pastor, I was in Chicago, and the pastor was doing a series on worship and stuff, and he felt it would be good for people to understand what it means to worship God and to submit to God and express that in their posture. 
And so he wanted to do a, anyway, I won't get into the details of a service. It was kind of like, imagine that Jesus is here and respond, you're responding to him properly. So when we're singing our worship songs, you should raise your hands in worship. And maybe when we're praying, we ought to kneel together to pray. And so he wanted them to do that during that service as part of the worship experience of, of this particular kind of topic. And by the way, both of those are great ideas. Both of those are biblical ideas. They're both in the Bible. Raise your hands to worship God, kneel to pray. Doesn't mean you have to do it every time. Don't get hung up on that. I'm just saying it's a biblical idea. However, that pastor uh, was not a beginner, so he felt he wasn't going to tell them and told me I had to tell them to do it. <laughs> so it's like, what do you mean I tell them to do it? Okay, when this song times, you get up and tell them they must all kneel now. Like, what do you mean tell them? Like, say, you must all kneel now. <laughs> so you get one guess how many people love that. <laughs> I mean, take a guess. Mm, no, I don't think there were three. What I know is they didn't blame the lead pastor, and he never claimed ownership of telling me I had to do it. He just let me eat the problem, and it was a big problem. And some of them had really good reasons for the problem, by the way. Some of their, their backgrounds come out of religious backgrounds, various different religious backgrounds, where the image of things was more important than the reality. And so they didn't like that. They didn't like being told they had to do this, which maybe comes from a particular background that they came from where that was normal, and now they're trying to experience liberty in Christ, all that stuff. So I get all of that kind of stuff. What I do know is there was an awful lot of people also just didn't like it because they were being asked to submit, specifically being told to submit. And we are so, so bad at this. So let me just be crystal clear again. I'm not suggesting for a moment in a church you should be submitting to a preacher or to any person. I am recommending that if we want to listen well, then we're going to learn to submit to God's word and we are going to humbly respond to God. Because he's God, we're not, we're going to deal with it. We're going to learn how to do that. And any decent preacher anywhere in the world is always going to preach their sermon to themselves before they ever preach it to anybody else. They're always going to fight their own fight of submission before they ever suggest it to anybody else. Because we have the same problem as anybody else. And trust me on this, it is not my natural gift. When I was pastoring in a church in Surrey for 20 years, people would come up occasionally and they'd say to me, and this still happens actually, they'd come up, David, you have to as soon as those words came out, the David, you have to, sometimes I'd see that it's not like some weird expression go over their face, and I'd turn around, and my wife, Joanna, is behind them. I'm like, no, no, no. Like, never, never use those words with David. <laughs> because you will not get a good response. And typically, still with the board I have, when they say to me, David, you have to, I'm like, hmm, have to. Have to is such a strong suggestion. <laughs> I feel there's always a choice. <laughs> And they just kind of look at me and I look at them because it's my automatic, natural human response to say submission is not my best thing. And James goes on and says the reason we do it in spite of that is because the word of God has power to save, has the power to save. We enter into a relationship with God by faith, trusting him at his word. Trusting him, in fact, that Jesus, we're told in John 1, is the word, the true revelation, the full revelation of God. And the Bible is the word of God speaking into our life, expressing who Jesus is and who the gospel is and how to live in him and what it looks like to be submissive to it. The word of God, we're told, saves us from the damnation of sin and the damage of sin. We're told it establishes our connection with God. It protects us from the disconnection that sin causes. We need it. If we're going to walk following God, there is a direct, very real, very tangible spiritual benefit from listening, hearing, and believing the words of God. Prepare to hear it. Accept it humbly. Receive it with submission. My guess is we could look around right now and realize we're not great at this. We're not great at this. And then there's a third step which is we follow our hearing with an obedient doing. We do something about it. And this is the words again of James. He says, don't merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. 
James is so subtle. <laughs> Don't merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but doesn't do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. One of the great, great lies of our culture is that knowing and doing is the same thing. That knowing and doing is the same thing. And one of the great fallacies in Canadian church culture that I deal with on pretty much a, well, for sure, a weekly basis, dealing with different conflicts and issues in churches, which is a large part of what I end up doing, is that people start thinking that knowing the word is the same thing as being obedient to it. And somehow, as Christians, we have an amazing capacity to spiritualize almost any situation so that we don't, in fact, have to be obedient to it. Why that's not true for us. And while I think it's fair to say that um, most Canadians have less and less Bible knowledge than they ever had in the past, for most Christians, that is Christ followers who are trying to follow a path of discipleship in Canada in the 21st century, the truth remains that there is wild amounts of knowledge that's accessible to us. Whether it's what you get on a Sunday in a church, whether it's what you get in a Bible study, or whether it's podcasts that you can listen to, it's available to you from anybody, anywhere in the world, all the time. You can have it all the time in your life. The problem is not knowledge. The problem is that we're taught far beyond the level of obedience. We know more than we're willing to do. And so James is super straightforward. He says, don't just listen, do something about it. Do something with what you learn. And the word listen in here, and he's got all these great words in this passage, this word listen is the same word we would use for auditing a course. That is when we sign up for a course, but we don't actually want to do any of the tests. We don't want to do any of the homework. We don't want to do any of the reading. We don't want to write any of the essays. We don't want to do any of the practical applications. We just want to listen. And so James says, is that what you want? That's what you want to do in the Christian life? It's an idea that appeals to a lot of us. Go where we learn stuff without having to be responsible for anything. James says it doesn't work. It's not enough. And A.W. Tozer, old great saint, who wrote a lot of great books, in his book, Root of the Righteous, said this. He said, and this is a long time ago, it appears that too many Christians want to enjoy the thrill of being right, but are not willing to endure the inconveniences of being right. So the divorce between theory and practice becomes permanent. Truth sits forsaken and grieves till her professed followers come home for a brief visit, but she sees them depart again when the bills come due. We like the idea, but we don't want to pay the price. We don't want to be obedient to it. And the simple truth is this. If we want to be vitally interested in a sermon or in ever hearing from God in his word, it's because we're planning to do something with it that will change our life. Whenever we know that something is going to change what we do, we care about it. But if we don't ever care about what we're doing, so we're going to go to church, listen to a sermon, listen to a Bible site, do whatever it is, read it, listen, then go out and do nothing about it, of course it's boring. Because it's irrelevant. We've made it irrelevant. It's not changing anything for us. And James says the Bible is like a mirror you have to pay attention to. If we listen but we don't pay attention, don't change, it's like looking in a mirror and ignoring what we see. So I don't know if you ever do that. I do that. You know, every day I get up and I look in a mirror. It's not a pretty sight. It, I feel a bit of despair, actually. You know, so the very little bit of hair that I have left, that's why it's short now, it solves a bit of this problem, is all over the place. I have like big raccoon eyes. I don't understand whether it's like, like do you see, like they're, they're raccoon eyes. You see what I'm talking about? Right there, that's why I wear the glasses, they're fake. So, okay, that's a lie. Also, that's a lie. So now, now see how sin multiplies? So we have nothing to do with that. You know, but I look in the mirror and I think I look too heavy or too skinny. You see how we lie to ourselves yet again? I'm too pale, or I'm getting too many freckles. It's one or the other, I don't get tan, so it's one of those two every time. My ears are too big or they're too small or they're not quite even. That's a problem. I'm old-ish now, but I'm a ginger. That means I still sometimes get pimples. Do you know what that's like? 
It's like God laughing at you, saying to the archangel Michael, come and watch. Have you considered my servant David? Watch this. <laughs> it's like a good time for God. Occasionally, this is actually true, I'll, I'll get up, I take off my glasses, I look in a mirror, and I think I look like Darth Vader in the Star Wars movie when he pulled off his hat. <laughs> Have any of you ever thought that, like consciously? That's the despair I feel sometimes. So we go to work on the raw material, trying to hide that, trying to make it up. If it's, you know, for women it's called makeup, for men it's, I think it's called blemish remover. I've never used it, just by the way, that is true. I'm just trying to suffer for Jesus. So, you know, you, know, you choose then to take a shower, you comb over the bald spot, you look for clothes that are big enough to make us look small. You try to fake out people every way you can, because that's what we do with the way we look. And James, who knows that, and it's sort of reassuring to know if you go back millennia, they had the same problem. He says, you look in a mirror and you want to forget what it looks like. The Bible doesn't let you do that. You don't get to do that. The Bible is the ultimate truth teller. The Bible allows for no self-deception, no lack of self-awareness. If you look at it and you listen to it and you hear what God is saying, God will say things to you you do not like and demand changes you do not want to do. And James says, if you want to be a great listener, look, you've got to get prepared beforehand. You've got to spiritually prepare. You've got to be willing to be submissive to what you hear. And by the way, then you've got to be willing to do something about it. And he gives three examples. We don't have the time to go into them in the last part of this chapter, where he talks about how the word of God should change us. Examples of them, not the big picture of them. Like controlling what we say, controlling how we care for people, controlling how we choose and how we distance ourselves from sin. All that matter. If we plan on being changed, if we're looking to the Bible and we're hearing God's word, whether it's in a sermon or personally, however it is, however we're listening, and we're planning to be changed, it will always be relevant. Always be relevant. It will have our attention. When I was trying to dig irrigation to save all my plants from being killed by my wayward children, when I was doing that, I watched four hours of YouTube videos on how to connect little pipes with a little clipper thing, crimper, a thing. It's a thing you buy, and it goes like this, and it does it. I don't even know what it was called. I didn't care. I just cared. Do I know how to put irrigation to save these things? I spent four hours, and I was interested. I even went back to them. I went and took little pipes and did a couple of them while watching on YouTube, so I knew how. Do you know how bad interest gets? This past week, I spent a full hour looking up interested in a thing called a waiver of subrogation. Actually, I did that <laughs> with Beth Collins. She was in the room with me when we did that, looking it up. It was in part of a lease that we're given to somebody like, what's a waiver of subrogation? Well, it means that if the person who's leasing from you does something and they get sued, the insurance company can choose to sue the owner instead in order to get their money back from a third party from you. It's like, who knew that? Anyway, it was interesting because it could save you from a ton of liability. I'm super bored by that. It's a legal mumbo jumbo to me. But I spent an hour looking up. Why? Because it mattered. That's why. Because if it matters to us, you will take the most boring sounding thing and it will be interesting. But if you're not planning to change anything, you're not going to do anything with it whatsoever, of course we get bored. Of course we find it difficult to listen to. So the question is super simple. What are we going to do with what we hear? What are we willing to do with it? I've sat through a sermon or two. I started adding it this week in preparation and I gave up. 3,000 plus for sure. I guarantee that. I've got more than 2,500 of them that I've done over my life, 2,500 of them. So here's my confession to you. It's why this passage is of interest to me. Listening to a sermon is not the easiest thing I can do, oddly enough. I've come to church tired sometimes where I've sat down and wanted to sleep. But the person up front just keeps talking and talking and talking. No consideration. 
I've been restless in uncomfortable seats. I've made interesting doodles on sermon note pages in more churches than you can count. I've daydreamed through long-winded speakers wondering about who the Canucks should draft. I've looked up commentaries, and I think this might be a good thing for me, I'm not sure, so you can judge me later. Okay, I've looked up commentaries while preachers preach to find out whether they're making it up or not. So I have like a whole thing on my phone that I can look up hundreds of commentaries and check what they're saying, also see if they've bought it online. So all of which is to say sometimes it's not that easy through the whole thing. I've read whole books of the Bible to decide if they're in context of, as to what they're saying. Well, I mean, I've done all those things. That's the confession. Judge me. Go ahead. <laughs> and always, always, because of my job and part of it is teaching and immerse and all that sort of thing, it's a unique and terrible reality of the job is you evaluate every sermon you ever hear. Whether I want to or not, my brain is there. And because those things are true, I recognize the huge responsibility of being a person up front who ever speaks. To try and not be terribly boring, to try and be relevant, to try and show that what the Bible is saying matters to you, to try and be clear about what it is, to try and do all those things. I don't always succeed in that. I'm not always great at it. But here is the one true unrelenting fact. I'm not profound. And I have nothing profound to say. That's what's true. And if you're in church listening to a sermon, that should make you very, very happy. Because the only profound thing you want to hear is what God says. You don't care what I say, and you shouldn't. You should care what God says and whether it's true to the word of God when you hear it. Because the Bible is profound, it is relevant, it is powerful, it is sharp, it is immediate, it is life-changing, and it is the Holy Spirit's job to convict, to encourage, to change, to empower. It is not the job of any preacher on any Sunday, sunny, Sunday anywhere. That's God's job. And the reason that our culture is in trouble with values is that we have succumbed to a cult of personality where social media presence, family name, TV personalities, power, money, matters more than the word of God in the church. And we've seen that and we've seen the problem of that all over. And the hypocrisy of the church is that we complain about that in our culture and then we do exactly the same thing in the church. It is the word of God that matters, not the words of a superstar on a Sunday. It is the words of God that matter. And let's be super clear, the superstar theory has not worked out for the church in North America in obvious, obvious ways. And I'm saying all of that, again, with the full understanding of the responsibility and privilege that anybody who ever speaks in a church has. The responsibility that God's given us. But that's why the art of listening is so critical. If we become great listeners, then the human speaker is no longer the determiner of impact. We are. We are. So let me remind you again, if 200 people are here on a Sunday morning, 216 people days of sermon per year is being used. That's how much time we spend. And those are a lot of days we never get back. So maybe rather than counting on one person to make those hours meaningful, we ought to redevelop the personal art of listening for ourselves where God's word becomes alive to us. How do we do it? So simple. Be prepared when we get here. Be prepared to hear it. Be submissive to what God is saying and be prepared to do something and change because of it. And then we will be interested. It will matter. And according to James, if we do those things, in verse 25, then you will be blessed. So here's my message for you, super simple. Go and be blessed. Let's pray. Father, thank you that your word is so clear, so simple, so convicting for me, maybe for every one of us. Father, we do pray that your spirit would work in us, uh, even as we hear stuff 
about submissiveness, about preparation, about obedience, there's a part of us as human beings, sinful human beings, that resists that. And so we pray that through your spirit you would break through the boundaries and the walls we create or allow in our lives that get in the way of hearing from you. We know that we need even your help to just hear. So we pray that that would be true. You would be honored and we would be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen.